Uh, there's there are a lot of topics we could touch upon, um, just because there's so many themes in your book. But there's two particularly that I wanted to focus on. Uh, one is Afghanistan mm -hmm. and um, the Islamic culture, and, but the other though is uh, one of the bigger components of your book, which is the nature of duality, uh, which is very common to a lot of Americans. It's a nation of immigrants, and many of us have a heritage we claim besides being American. So uh, with that in mind, I wanted to bring up an, uh, an anecdote from the book where you talk about going, when you move over to the, uh, to, uh, the, this new, um, to follow your father to his new, his new post, and there are going to be a lot of American kids there, and you're excited, and you're writing about this is going to be great, we're finally going to meet other Americans, and, and you know, this is, this what, a, what a great opportunity. And uh, so when you go meet the kids, they're playing, and there's a clubhouse type of thing going on. And at one point, one, one of the kids, a boy, says, uh, referring to your sister and you, hey, look, who let those dirty Afghans in? <laughs> and at that moment, you're kind of like, you know, you stop cold. And uh, you write, we remained Americans with an asterisk. You're talking about later afterwards about you know how you have, as new kids came in and stuff and you you guys became you know, kids would rotate out you you guys became the ones to show them around et cetera but you always felt at that point that you were Americans with an asterisk so what I wanted to ask you was uh, do you still feel that way? Well, um, no, I don't at all. And the thing about being an American is uh, every American is sort of an American with an asterisk, you know. Um, in contrast to, to living in Afghanistan when I lived there, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like despite all the kind of the ethnic patchwork that is Afghanistan and all the linguistic sort of confusion that's there, uh, Af Afghan society is much more monolithic. Uh, and the, the mere fact that uh, American society is basically individualistic, uh, it means that in, in America you construct an identity by taking one from column A and two from column B and mm -hmm. you put together your own thing. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 it took me a, a few years. It took me like 10 years or something to really f figure out that I was an American or to feel comfortable about being here. Uh, but now I completely feel like an American. So, Is that what you meant uh, in the point of the book when you write that after you sent off the email to 9-11? Uh, you felt as though these two parts of you were fused, that you gave, your, as you say, your American voice, use your American voice to, 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 to talk about um, Afghanistan. Is that, is that what you mean by that, that suddenly you, you felt whole as an American or that your identity was resolutely American? Well, you know, um, I, I, f I feel that what I discovered in the course of the, the confused period after 9-11, the mm -hmm. confused and terrifying period after 9-11, was that at least here in America, uh, Afghans are just as, as um, are not monolithic the way I felt we were in Afghanistan. I, mm -hmm. I feel that Afghans here are also going through uh, a fragmentation and confusion about identity and that, uh, that I can be as Afghan as I want or I can be as an American as I want. It isn't quite as much either or uh, now the situation we've reached here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that answers that question. No, well, I mean, as um, much as, you know, you can, you know, someone can provide a definitive answer you know, to something like that, because identity is, is, is so fluid, right? I mean, I mean, reading the book, you realize, and there's parts where, you know, you say, and this is, you know, I would think not uncommon to most people uh, who are, you know, if, if they're not a wasp, um, that, you know, when you're in one situation, say, among Afghans, uh, you feel particularly more American. Mm -hmm. You know, but then in other certain situations, you feel as if though there's that other part of you, you know, that 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 comes, that be, be, that that makes itself known. Well, you know, um, um, after I wrote my book, I started to hear from young Afghans in America, mm -hmm. and quite often these these guys would say, um, you know, I read your book and I feel it spoke to me. I feel like it's my experience you're talking about. And initially, my reaction was, no, it isn't. You know, my experience is exactly the opposite of you guys because. Um, I, I grew up in Afghanistan, and when I went home, it was America. And you guys are growing up in America, and when you go home, it's Afghanistan. That's, a, that's the mirror image. That's the complete opposite. Right. Um, but, but then as I got to know more uh, young Afghans, 
uh, I began to realize that split identity is split identity. You know, it's like there's something about that that's, a, that's a, an experience that goes across uh, all these different lines. And, um, uh, you know, my, uh, my friend Biz, uh, young Afghan-American artist, uh, one day said to me, um, he said, um, um, I feel like, w or, or growing up, I felt like when I went out and went to school, I pretended to be an American, mm -hmm. and then when I came home, I pretended to be an Afghan. Uh, and so the question was, where was I not pretending? And I think that's, you know, that's something that's, that's the core of the uh, split identity bicultural experience. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, uh, what I realize is that I have been in many split identity bicultural experiences that aren't necessarily cultural, and that, that you know, uh, when I think about that, I realize that, that we all go through many kind of versions of that. And what, what would be one? Well, uh, you know, at one time I was a hippie in Portland, and then uh, uh, I decided to get a job many years after uh, graduating from college <laughs> and, and joining society. And so I came down here, and uh, kind of accidentally I got a job at the Asia Foundation. Mm -hmm. And the Asia Foundation was was and is, you know, a suit and tie place where everybody was, uh, you know, very um, uh, respectable and, 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 and sure. you know, to my mind, uh, Sober. very Republican. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I bought a suit and tie uh, at a Goodwill store, uh, not having any idea that, uh, that uh, uh, men's fashions change from year to year. <laughs> And so I, I came to work, you know, and I felt like I was in disguise, and I felt like, man, I'm, if they ever find out who I really am. Um, you Back know, to Portland. Then, then eventually I discovered that every, most of us were in disguise. You know, we're all, we all wore, put on our suits and came to work, but when we went home, we were different people. Sure. Uh, and many different kinds of different people. Sure. So. Um, which makes me think, actually, of your, of your brother Riaz. Mm -hmm. and the, do you think... Um, in, in, uh, do you think that perhaps part of the reason that uh, uh, he became so fundamentalist in his beliefs was because he maybe he couldn't deal with that sort of uh, the idea of, of, of duality? You're never really, you're kind of pretending always to be something. You're never going to, there's never going to be <coughs> anything that's going to be 100% definitive and this is going to be purely your identity. Well, uh uh, you know, I, I, you're inviting me to speak about Riaz in a certain way that um, mm -hmm. that I sort of want to avoid because it, uh, it, uh, uh, to say this is why he became a fundamentalist okay. because he had these deficits of personality. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I, I don't want to say that because he's a thinking human being that made his choice. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, I noticed that was curious, uh, you, obviously there's something about the bicultural experience that he reacted to uh, in embracing Islam the way he did. Um, and, uh, and he went back to, to Pakistan. He couldn't go to Afghanistan, but he was uh, knock, knocking about on the border area, Peshawar and, you know, there. Uh, and whatever he saw really spoke to him, and he, and he converted. Um, but recently he came to visit me, like mm -hmm. a couple of months ago. And I took him to um, uh, Fremont with me because I had an event there that um, was... Uh, basically an Afghan event, everybody there was going to be Afghan. Uh, and he was very alienated and uncomfortable there. He didn't Why? feel, because he's a, uh, he's a, a nouveau uh, Muslim, and, and he didn't, he's not an Afghan, he's a Muslim, you know, that's a different thing. Sure. Um, and uh, I think many of his friends are people of all different cultures who have either converted to Islam or uh, have reconverted to a uh, more zealous and and uh, fundamentalist version of Islam, even if they had an Islamic family or whatever. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, at this event in Fremont, uh, you know, many of the the young uh, Afghans, mm -hmm. especially, uh, uh, for example, the young Afghan women, mm -hmm. were dressed to the nines, very fashionable, you know. Uh, and uh, that didn't uh, suit Riaz's sensibility about how people should be. So, you know, I think most of the Afghans there would, would very uh, indignantly uh, claim that we are Muslims. What are you talking about? You know, you're criticizing sure. me for not being Muslim enough? Uh, <laughs> but 
in fact, that would be as criticism of them. You guys are not doing the, the, the thing the way you're supposed to. So. Well, the interesting thing is that you get that in so many other different eth uh, ethnic cultures. I mean, where you'll have, you know, for example, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Mexican-American, and you'll definitely get into situations where that sort of identity is politicized. And the question becomes, well, are you, you know, if you act a certain way, you're not acting Mexican enough. Or, yes. yeah, you know, I mean, the, I, reading your book, that's, that's one of the things that struck me was how much of a parallel there was that to, to uh, 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 similar uh, experiences for other ethnic groups yeah. where you realize that, yeah, you know, and also another point that you make in the book, um, and I guess this is what I meant when I was talking about how your brother Riaz decided to um, ad adopt uh, this nouveau Islam, as you call it. Uh, you say that, you know, you're often pulled, when the, the, the wider the gap, the farther away you are, when you have like these two identities, mm -hmm. you f often feel more the pressure that you have to choose one. Yeah. Right? And I think maybe that's, I think that's what I was trying to get at, that he just basically said, right, I'm going to choose, and this is what I'm comfortable with, and that's that. Yeah, he certainly did. He chose something that he feels comfortable with, but, uh, you know, uh, he couldn't choose to be Afghan because he didn't exactly grow up as an Afghan, you know. He, his, little, his, right? very... his childhood was spent in this Afghan-American town, and since he was a little baby and up to about seventh grade or something, he didn't really go to school, Afghan school, so his friends were all Americans. And then he had a period in Kabul that we were back in Kabul, and he was going to Afghan school, and we didn't know any Americans. And it was very difficult for him, you know. He was like seven to nine or ten years old. Uh, and he didn't feel like he fit in at all. Then we came here, and he completely didn't fit in here. So right. uh, much more than me, he just didn't fit in anywhere. Uh, uh, I was. This uh, reminds me of something else too from from the book. When I was uh, when we get to the middle section where you're talking about going traveling through the uh, uh, Islamic world and you know for this uh, for the Pacific News Service, you're going to do this 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 big think piece. And um, as you get Frankly, more and more annoyed with the people you meet. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, the 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 um, the, the, the travel guides, Morocco, the, uh, basically every f official in Alger Algeria, um, with the Iranian uh, uh, young men at the at the embassy in Turkey, the Iranian the Iranian embassy in Turkey. Um, I kept thinking, now is is he getting more and more annoyed because you haven't had any sleep, <laughs> or? Or is it because is it starting to dawn on you that you actually don't have as much in common uh, with the sort of large Islamic world as you thought you did? Uh, well, first of all, annoyed wasn't the emotion I had in the Iranian embassy. It was more like very nervous. I was frightened there. Right. <laughs> you know. Oh, well, on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on yeah. the way out. Uh, and yeah, uh, you know, I think I was I was encountering the fact that um, there's many kinds of Islam in the world, and there's many movements in Islam, and there it's not all like it was, you know, like the Islam I knew as a kid growing up in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was encountering the fact that there there is a uh, a politicized um, you know, radical Islam in the world that was there then in 1979 or whenever, uh, yeah, I think that's it, right. 79, 80, when I was traveling. It was very well developed and it was, uh, and, and it was not kind of the cultural uh, conservative Islam that, that I knew as a kid. You know, there's a difference between political, radical, back to the 7th century Islam mm -hmm. and old-fashioned, very conservative Islam. They, they might seem the same, but, but they're actually very different. Uh, and the um, you know the uh, the old conservative Islam that I grew up with is very softened by tradition and all kinds of little customs, and it's hard to tell where the the Islam ends and the cultural uh, sure. practices begin. But this new Islam is idealistic, which or ideological, mm -hmm. which means it's uh, it's uh, it's formed out of a book, you know. So it's very kind of black and white hard-edged, uh, you're in or you're out, mm -hmm. you know. And well, it's, it's that, you, as you, at one point, as you summarize it so well, you say that, you know, it basically views world history as this constant battle between God and Satan. Yes. And you're either uh, on God's side or you're on Satan's side. Now, 
reading your book, what struck me as being so awful, I mean, not awful about the book, but in terms of situation, is that's not at all unlike what Richard Hofstetter wrote in the paranoid style of American politics yes. about neocons in America. And, I, and uh, I was wondering if, while you were writing the book or even afterwards, has occurred to you uh, how much of a parallel there is between um, you know, what we would call radical conservative Islam and some, some parts of the Christian right in this country? Well, you know, uh, in writing my new book, I, I, I found myself writing this passage about uh, the period when I think Islam became uh, very sort of hard-edged ideological conservative, and that was around uh, the time of the Crusades. Uh, and uh, before that, for like 300 years since the founding of it, it was a civilization with philosophers and you know science and all kinds of different uh, ways of thinking and stuff. Mm -hmm. And and then what happened is that everything began to crumble, and the whole world was under attack from Turk Turkish mm -hmm. barbarian invaders, and every day was very uncertain. And it struck me that the uh, the 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 theologians at that point who were preaching the idea that. Uh, you know, you can't use reason to figure out the difference between right and wrong. You got to look it up in the book. Um, you know, you got to start the, from uh, something. Teacher's that's, yes, the yeah. teacher's edition. Yes, the teacher's edition with the annotations. Right. Uh, and what struck me is that you know, if you have, if you agree to the idea that that um, uh, you know, reasonableness is is the is the uh, measuring stick, mm -hmm. and you can use your your instincts, and you you have dialogue with people. Well. Every person ends up having a slightly different position in the world. <laughs> right. You see, uh, um, you know, as long as you admit there's shades of gray, then there's a million different places to be. And in times of chaos and uncertainty and fear, uh, people don't want to be isolated in their own little one one of a kind position. They want to clump together. They want to be part of a herd. And uh, black and white ideologies enable people. To clump together, um, and so I think times of uh, fear, anxiety, and uncertainty breed uh, uh, the popularity of idea systems that say, you know, it's down to one big battle between God and Satan, black and white, communisms and dem democ or whatever, you know, all these different dualities, sure, and sure. Uh, that has happened in the Muslim world in part because that world has been under attack and fraying for several centuries now. It's an old thing that's been happening in the Muslim world, and, and it emerges from that. But I think, you know, there is fear of uncertainty and, uh, and anxiety about endless random change in America that renders popular uh, fundamentalist notions that emerge out of Christian doctrine, which right. has happened here. Right, absolutely. Uh, and they are mirror images of each other, sure. You have a, a, a chapter in the book entitled Unintended Consequences, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, very mordant, actually, in, in the way you <laughs> sure so this domino effect of, of awful things that happen after you know one uh, westernizing reform after another just just really you know goes backward. And if anything, instead of modernizing Afghanistan, seems to have hurled it further back into the past. And I wanted to ask you, uh, do you see this trend continuing now, uh, particularly with you know with the war, the U.S. and, and, and Canadians and in Afghanistan presently? Is it is it are we still going down that track? Well, you know, um, it's hard to say where we're going to end up in Afghanistan now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, why is that? Huh? Well, because um, right after the Taliban were driven out, I think there was like this huge moment of of opportunity in Afghanistan uh, because, um, you know, Afghans were ready to to look for, solu for uh, they were ready to embrace peace if peace was possible, would be possible. Um, and um, it didn't happen that way because the war in Iraq started, that was a catastrophe. Uh, it took all the attention away from Afghanistan. Uh, this whole reconstruction thing has been a total fiasco. You know, it's like it's been really bad. Mm -hmm. um, some of that, however, is this unintended consequences thing. Um, what One of the things that's happened in Afghanistan is that 
big money has come in. So it's not like there's no money been spent in Afghanistan. Big money has come in. Mm-hmm. Um, and not just from the U.S., you know, China and, and Japan and, and other countries have put, put in money. And uh, so foreign companies and foreign workers have set up offices in Kabul from where they're going to do the work out in the, in the countryside. Mm-hmm. And they have a scale of money to spend that is completely different than the scale of the economy that, that was there in Afghanistan. So there, you know, So anyone who has a house to rent to a foreigner is obviously going to charge what the market will bear. Why wouldn't right. they? Uh, and I remember I talked to one guy who had been uh, trying to do some uh, uh, charity sort of work in Afghanistan, even back in the days of the Taliban. Mm-hmm. And he was renting an office for like $100 a month or something. And by the time I talked to him, like two or three years after the um, uh, the reconstruction began, that office cost 4000 a month. Dear Imagine Lord. that. Well, you write about this uh, uh, in your book, too, with your aunt, where someone wanted to buy the compound. Uh, yes. The Saudis were coming in yes, at yes. that time, right? And right, what right. was selling for an exorbitant amount they want, were willing to pay an exorbitant amount of money for. Yeah, that's right. And so then that raises everything. That raises all the rents, all the prices. Uh, and now, uh, you know, you have a situation where, you know, you can't find a place to live. And people who are working for the NGOs, well, they get paid by NGOs at, at global scales. So they can afford something. But the rest of the people are working for the local economy. You know, the, the policemen are making $50 a month. Uh, teachers are making something like that. Gas still costs $5 or more a gallon. Imagine oh. if you're working, you know, you're trying to get to work and, and it's that situation. So everybody who has any possibility of getting some extra income will use that. Of course they will. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're a postal worker and you're selling a stamp for uh, 10 Afghanis, you don't to charge 10 Afghanis for that. You can charge 100 <laughs> Afghanis for that. Um, because you need it to, to, to survive. Yeah. Uh, I heard um, when I was in Kabul, there were like four or five car accidents that I saw. Right. And when <laughs> and was this? This was in uh, 02 or 03. Uh, okay. Uh, and, um, um, you know, so I asked uh, my cousin there, I said, uh, do the police come, or what's what happens when there's a car accident? Says, oh yes, the police comes. Well, what do the police do? That the police finds everybody involved, <laughs> levies a fine, and goes away. That's a windfall. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, you know that that doesn't seem fair. He doesn't try to figure out whose fault it was or anything, and uh, and that's all he does. He said, yeah, well, you know, he said, no, I don't blame them. They have to make a living too. So, <laughs> so you know, so so. The, the attempt to, to reconstruct in the way that it was done in Afghanistan mm-hmm. ends up in a situation where there's rampant, pervasive corruption. Everybody is taking bribes. Uh, so now no work can get done. Um, you know, unintended consequences. There's Absolutely. a chain of... And now we have, of course, uh, the Taliban is resurgent once again, it seems, in the South at least. Well, um, uh, you know... The, the Taliban, there was something called the Taliban until 2002 or 2000, end of, you know, mm-hmm. until they were driven out. Uh, and by that I mean there was a Mullah Omar, the head of that, comp- of that uh, group. Uh, there were ministers, there was, uh, there was an organization, there were cadre. Uh, now I don't think it's possible to say what there is that is called Taliban. What do you, what do you think it is? I think it's much more amorphous and much more... Um, uh, self-generating and self-regenerating. I think it's an attitude. I think it's a uh, uh, a really vague sort of movement. So it's not an official affiliation or anything like that. It's... I don't think it's an official affiliation, which means uh, it's not conquerable by by standard military means. You can't find the headquarters and and uh, bomb it. You can't find their network of communications and disrupt it. You know, it's like. They don't care. Uh, if, cool. if it's well known that any act of sab- sabotage will help the cause, you know, and everybody right. sort of knows what the cause is, then anybody can say, I think I'll do something. And they don't need to wait for orders from above, you know, so. Uh, well, this, this sort of leads to something else you wrote in the book where you talked about when you, when you were sent off uh, on, this, on this long trip to the Islamic world and you were going to write your big piece. The working theory was that um, 
this, uh, that, that uh, the reason for this resurgency or for the popularity of this particular brand of Islam was because it would offer a material solution to material problems. So basically, you know, um, this is, you know, it would end rampant poverty. It would, uh, you know, end all these sort of um, the social uh, inequalities. Yeah. Um, but it becomes rather clear, though, that that's not the, the motivation for it. As with your brother in the book, when you write about that, it says, you know, materialism is not the motivation behind this sort of thing. Um, that being the case, then, how, do, how, do, how, do you, how does one manage that? Uh, or, you know, dealing with that, with, with, with that mindset? Well, um, uh, I guess what I was referring to there about materials not uh, not being uh, material uh, goals not being at the bottom of this, uh, I was um, trying to draw a distinction between the Marxist analysis okay. of uh, of all this uh, uprising, where um, you know Marxists would say, "Oh, this is good. This is the uh, the, the proletarian working urban working class rising," mm -hmm. and uh, and all we have to do is get rid of this superstructure of Islam, and we got a revolutionary class here. Um, but I think, um, um, uh, well, you know, of course, if if you're a Muslim and you're involved in this movement, it's irreducible that believing in God and believing in the mythology of Islam, the religious mythology of Islam, is part of what you're doing. You know, it's like it's not just an added superstructure. Uh, it is the reason. It is the reason. It's what you think. Um, but it's also the case, uh, and this is something I'm trying to trace in my, in my new book, it's also the case that uh, an idea of social justice is at the very core of Islam. It's, ha it's how it started, and it was, very st uh, uh, it was a very prominent part of the Muslim story in that first 50 years when Islam was conquering the world. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk about that in your book briefly too. Yes, I talk about it briefly. I go into it more in this in this new book. Um, and and the thing is, you know, when you look at uh, at uh, what Muhammad was preaching in Mecca before he 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 went to Medina, it was all about uh, you know widows and orphans. That's the, that would be the best way to sum it up. You know, it's like you can't just uh, uh, live high on the hog. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, don't have anything to do with no, hogs. Yeah, no, no living off the hog at all. <laughs> uh, you, but you know, you have to take care of the widows and orphans, <laughs> yes. and you have to. Uh, uh, and if you're if you're living sumptuously, then something's wrong. Um, and then when they went to Medina and they started the Muslim community, it's a such a core part of the mythology of both Muhammad and all of his first successors. And they didn't wear rich clothes, you know. They they wore rags. They looked just like anyone else. You couldn't tell the Khalifa from anybody else. Right. Um, and you know, in the in the early days of conquest, uh, there was no uh, treasury. You know, in 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 Medina, they they sent the money back. It was distributed immediately. It wasn't until like the third successor to Muhammad that they the guy said, you know what? <laughs> hey, let's, there's a lot of money in this. Let's yeah. let's put some of this in a bank and use it for some public good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you gonna do? Um, <laughs> you know, like, what you're talking about that though becomes at least to me. You know, I see the uh, the parallels to to. Uh, Christianity and the parts, at least the teachings of Christ. Yes, you know, which focuses on that too, and that sort of social justice becomes a big part of that. Right, you know, but how funny that, maybe not so funny, but uh, maybe how how sad that is. And you have um, some very, uh, if you if you will, ungenerous translations of all these sort of of teachings. Um, I, 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 the, the other question I was going to ask you too was that when you were writing in your in, in the book about uh, how you felt about your sort of ambivalent, uh, not entirely ambivalent about the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and uh, well, only well, you mean the sense because you're talking to this guy in Turkey and he's like, well, you know, it'll be good because the, the, they'll go in there and they'll modernize the place and yeah, right, you right. know, right, exactly. But at the same point, we're going, no, wait, this is awful. You know, they're going in there and they're, and, and they're killing people and they're maiming you know, children with those awful, you know, uh, 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 landmines yeah. that, you know, look like, you know, look like toys and this sort of thing. And how overall what made you angry <laughs> was that this idea as if though they were going to civilize, you know, uh, you know the, these animals in Afghanistan. And, I, you know, I have to, I have to, I have to think that um, what's going on now then must be driving you crazy. 
Uh, it seems, you know, frankly, sort of a repeat of that sort of thinking in, in, the, um, in the region. Well, you know, uh, the curious thing is, uh, I'll have to say this, that the curious thing is that uh, even though I think, you know, the, mili the military has made all kinds of terrible mistakes and they keep bombing villages and civilians die, and, and, and I kind of know why that happens, you know. Uh, um, but, but before I go into that, let me just say that of all the things that, that are being done or have been done in Afghanistan that are reconstruction efforts, mm -hmm. I think the, milita the U.S. military has done some of the, the best stuff in, of that. Uh, you know, they've built schools, they've uh, restored water systems, they've done that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so uh, really it's, it's the political... The neocons. Yeah, it's the management of that that's, that's really um, uh, uh, idiotic and it's led to all this trouble. Um, however, it is the case, you know, it's like I've talked to some of these military guys and um, um, they don't have a proper, uh, uh, you know, they don't really know anything about the country and they're kind of proud that they're using um, uh, local or native translators and so they're, they're really working with the people, they told me, and they told me that, uh, um, you know, uh, with, with good information from these translators, they were able to, during the election time, uh, kill 100 Taliban who were going to uh, disrupt the election. And I'm saying, well, how do you know those were Taliban? <laughs> you know, how do you know you just didn't kill 100 guys that your translators didn't like? Um, because uh, I know that in my village, during the Soviet era, mm -hmm. there was a feud between two sets of families, and one of them went to the communists and you know in in Kabul and said these other this other family they're in league with the guerrillas and they're uh, you know it's a nest of rebels so the communists went and bombed them and they got rid of them and they took their land oh. uh, so this can happen in these situations and what's the the guard against that I don't know I don't, I don't um, think there is you... and I will say that um, you know my uh, I speak for C pretty well but not not great and mm -hmm. I can't read it very well at all and but the language that they speak in the southern part of Afghanistan is uh, Pashto, which is a whole different language, which I don't speak at all. So just the other day, I got a call from somebody that said, uh, you know, we're recruiting translators, and we think you might be the guy. And I said, well, I, I don't think so. But, <laughs> but I, I talked to him a little uh, bit. Job's and, a job. Yeah, and he said, uh, uh, you know, $225,000 uh, for a one-year contract. You want to go? And I said, well, no, I don't, actually. Uh, but, but I'll tell you, I... I don't really speak, uh, I don't speak Pashto at all, so I don't, you know, aside from I don't want to do this, yeah. uh, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. And he said, that doesn't matter that much, you, you speak it well <laughs> enough. <laughs> I'm going, I speak it well enough, I can say, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> wow, well, that's, so, that's not heartening. Yeah, so uh, that's, You speak uh, it well enough, uh, you'll learn on the job. You'll be all right. <laughs> you'll figure out. You got, you got a sense of what's going on. Wow, that's, that's not good. Um, so... Uh, when, when was the last time you've been back to Afghanistan? I went back right after the Taliban were driven out in 2002. 2002. Yeah. And uh, you still have family there? Well, yeah. I mean, I have one cousin who lived there then, mm -hmm. uh, of the first cousin level. Mm -hmm. And then I have lots of more distant relatives uh, whom I think of as distant relatives, but they don't think of me that way. You know, They, <laughs> <laughs> they think of me as a close relative. And how are they faring? Um, they were remarkably, uh, uh, you know, they, they seemed remarkably like the old days to me when I went there at mm -hmm. that point. Um, I went to the village, you know, and the village, uh, was very bustling and energetic and, um, they all, you know, at that point, the, the Taliban had just been driven out and there was talk of a Marshall plan for Afghanistan. So everybody was very upbeat. They, they all thought, you know, the war is over and, great things are going to happen. So everybody had a scheme. Everybody wanted to, uh, you know, get me involved in a scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody was planning to rebuild their this and, and plant that and so on. And, and see, what I'm saying about reconstruction is if only it hadn't been big ticket, big spending, you know, corporations coming and saying, we're going to build a this, you know. And we'll well, how should it have been, do you think? It should have been a, a voluminous micro lending uh, that went and, Put people in the country, and and took you know requests for uh, what do they call it RFP? Yeah. <laughs> uh, took uh, um, took the initiative from the the people there and 
funded them to do the 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 you know hundred thousand small things they wanted to do, rather than uh, uh, five or ten big things like a single highway from one city to the other city or a couple of cement plants or whatever. Um, stuff. Well, Bechtel doesn't. You know, and the thing is, you, you can't control that. And many of those people, I mean, I heard this, it's like, well, if you be giving uh, $100 here and $1,000 there to Afghans, how do you know they just won't spend it uh, on, you know? On what? What are they going to blow it on what? Video games? What? what? <laughs> they might, but, you know. <laughs> yes, but, they're going <laughs> <but, laughs> uh, to Vegas. That's what's going to happen. Many will, actually. <laughs> really? Right? Like, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of the money will be lost that way. But... A, money, a lot of the money is lost this way too. So it's it's like um, uh, it's like a question of will the money be lost in Afghanistan or will the money be lost on its way to Afghanistan? <laughs> that's that's a that's a question to ask. And you know, you just have to have some some level of trust at some point. Mm. All right, then I think uh, with that we'll end this part of the conversation right there because we want to open it up now to questions from you. So I think that's uh, Rosie back there with the microphone, if anyone has a question. Um, you were mentioning uh, about uh, survival, basic survival, and corruption, briberies and corruption. And I've been in a lot of different developing countries, and it's, I just, want to know what your thoughts are and how do you distinguish between the two? Because there are people like the, the postal worker who will charge a little bit more for a stamp because he wants to survive, he needs to survive. I mean, there's some fundamental things that we as Americans don't understand about fundamental survival and what it takes. And we perceive certain things as corruption when in country it's like, we're just trying to eat. In other words, we look at that as corruption and we don't, uh, we don't know how to deal with it and we, we're critical of it because we think of it as criminal activity or something like that. Um, you know, I, I I must say I hate these questions that say, what's the solution? Because <laughs> I never know. Uh, I'm uh, my, my whole orientation is say this problem, that problem. Um, well, you know, and, and right now when you ask that question, I'm thinking about uh, my friend Yalda, who more or less lives there, comes back occasionally. Uh, she was telling me that the... Um, uh, you know, that the price of bread was going up for a while uh, and went up to just catastrophic levels. And then the price of the bread stopped rising, but the bread got thinner and thinner. And now it's like just like buying an envelope or something. Um, so, uh, you know, it's one long connected thread, I'd say. And you have to find where is the first thing that you, could, that, that you can attack the problem. And I feel like uh, at, at least uh, until recently, I've been saying that the, the bottom of that whole thread is landmines uh, because there's still so many millions of them in the country and they make it impossible to have an, to restore an agricultural system. And Afghanistan is really basically an agricultural and herding economy. So unless you can make it possible for people to do that, uh, they'll do the only other thing they can do, which is opium. Um, and once you have opium going, you've got the makings of a narco state, and the one thing you need for a narco state is a lot of armed men who are ready to be thugs, and Afghanistan leads the world in that resource. So um, uh, so I think that's one of the big things. Um, there's this country-city thing in Afghanistan that's at a really extreme level. You know, it, it sort of exists everywhere in the world. We sort of have this blue blue state, green state thing, and that's a rural, urban sort of a, a split. But in Afghanistan, it's very, very pronounced. And um, uh, whatever's happening in the city, you know, to the extent that it's good, it's not happening in the country at all, um, in the countryside at all. So somehow, there has to be some way to get out into the countryside and do some good stuff there. Now, uh, so that's what I'm always thinking is that the place to start is out there. And uh, uh, what I think about is the fact that we have like this very large military force there. I think it's up to 50,000 now or something like that. And it was at 20,000 for quite a while and now it's, it's gone up like that. Um, and, um, but there is no uh, proposal for peace 
that's or or sort of reconstructive peace building kind of proposal that the military thing is built around. If you were to say, what is the military doing there? I think the answer would be they're they're there to fight the enemy, you know. And since I've since I think I've you know, in my opinion, I think I've explained that the enemy doesn't exactly exist. There is, you know, it's like it's hard to say what the enemy is. It melts into being the people, and so you end up in a situation where you're actually there creating the enemy. Whereas if instead of that, you started by saying, uh, in this area right here, we're going to clear the landmines and we're going to restore the damaged irrigation systems, and that's what we're here to do as Americans and, and our military is there to protect that project, and we're not going to let anybody sabotage that. Um, then the military has a purpose, and the purpose is in some way related to what people can, can you know, appreciate as being an effort to help them restore their lives. Um, then the military involvement would make sense, and I hope it would grow from there. So... You know, the, the corruption, you can't end it overnight. It's, uh, you have to get the disparity of income in some way remedied, and there's these other things you have to do first. I have the mic. Um, your mother, you know, was American, and she moved over there 20 years and raised the three of you. And when she came back here, I thought it was selfish that your father didn't stay because you said uh, she was 40 years old and didn't hold a job and she struggled to raise the three of you in America now. What are your thoughts on that? Did, I feel he was selfish for not making a life here. Uh, well, um, she struggled to raise one of us. You know, I was off in school on a scholarship. She didn't have to uh, support me and my sister was in college. so. When, once we came here, I never actually was a kid again. I was, you know, on my way to being an adult. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I don't have that judgment of my father. Uh, I don't think of it as selfish. Um, I think he was not as viable economically here as she was. I, I'm not sure. You know, it's like we don't know. Um, and uh, uh, it's hard to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else and say what would it mean to him, to what he thought was at stake, to never be with his with his Afghan family again, to never see his brothers again. Um, I guess I I don't have that <laughs> that judgment of him. It was tough for both of them. Uh, it's not clear that his wife really wanted him to stay. So, <laughs> so I. Uh, so there's that. I, I wasn't aware of that at the time, but I think I became aware of it later on. You know, there, there's a guy up here that... <laughs> Thank you. I'd, I'd have to say on the question of corruption, when I look at the Northern Alliance, it doesn't seem we've totally avoided uh, corruption in Afghanistan with the path we've chosen. But when I look at Afghanistan, there's Pakistan and the whole question of Indian Kashmir. There's Iran. There's Central Asia. Can you, what do you see happening to that whole region there? And how does Afghanistan fit into that whole geographic political picture, you think? Are you saying there's a lot of trouble in the region? Because, <laughs> yes, you're right. There's a lot of trouble in that region. Um, y you know, uh, it's, it's regional trouble, but there's also... Uh, you know, you can look at each of those places and see how they have particular problems that are particular to that place. Um, you know, here I go again uh, talking about complexity and problems, and I don't have any solutions. But uh, uh, I do know that, you know, in each of those places, and I know Afghanistan best, I know that there's a global sort of a thing lying on top of a long-standing whole other thing, which is local. And then they get mixed up, you know, in, in, um, in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, um, there was a whole Cold War kind of intrigue going on in Afghanistan that all of the innate Afghan conflicts mapped onto, you know, so there is like this ancient kind of uh, ethnic problems between the different ethnicities in Afghanistan, not to mention within the dominant ethnicity, the Pashtuns, 
there is a 300 year old uh, kind of feud going on between the southern Pashtuns and the northern Pashtuns. So all of this stuff was going on as well. Um, and, uh, and I think we often tend to look at a place like Iran or Afghanistan or any of these places and think of it only in terms of ourselves and, and how we're strategizing it. Um, so, you know, I, I think in Iran, for example, um, in the era, you know, since Bush came in, actually, um, there was a uh, demonization of Iran and looking at Iran strictly as being part of the uh, 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 global conflict, uh, struggle over oil, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the anti-Western, anti-U.S. kind of movement that's out there. And, uh, and so in the demonizing of Iran, our rhetoric, and I, as I understand that there was also actually uh, uh, quite a bit of actual incursions into Iran that we don't hear much about, but we have been bombing them uh, over these years. Um, so they, they felt threatened. And so the domestic politics was such that before we got aggressive, there was like a lot of pro-Americanism amongst the Iranian people, even though there wasn't in the Iranian government. Uh, and in Iran during that period, um, before Bush came in, uh, you know, after the the Iranian Revolution and before 2001, Iran was in the situation where it was um, uh, it was it had achieved a kind of a sovereignty and autonomy, and so it could finally begin to deal with the religious issue within Iranian society, the kind of the struggle between the uh, the clerical establishment, the old conservative religious folks, and the secular modernist new other Iran that also exists. Uh, they were they were working that out, and and I think the uh, old conservative religious establishment was starting to lose ground because there was no one to blame but them, and they were in charge now. But now with America coming in and being aggressive, it renewed a, a kind of a chauvinistic energy within Iran and got this guy Ahmadinejad elected and uh, a whole new ball game now. Now so uh, I think that kind of thing goes in each of these these local places. One more? I would like this thing of that you feel an American. Put the mic right here. Uh, that you feel like an American and that definition. I would like to that you talk a little bit more about that. I'm from Puerto Rico. I have been living here for 17 years. And I go back there very often. And the last time that I was there, I spent three months there. To Puerto I, Rico? To Puerto you go Rico. Back? And yes. And I came back. I lived there for three months last year, year and a half. And I came back here and I said, I cannot live in my country. I feel that many things from this culture that I love, but I identify, and then recently I went to, like w two weeks ago, I went to the Midwest and south of United States, and it was another word for me, it was another America. <laughs> and I, I don't want to hurt anybody here, maybe there's some people <laughs> from that area, but I say, no way. <laughs> and then I say, no, I'm Puerto Rican, I can. And I don't know if you make those distinctions because more than American, I feel like I'm fr San Franciscan. You know? <laughs> I'm like <laughs> <coughs> these things. Very you know, there are some things like I love from this culture, like and it's shock. I cannot deal with those things in Puerto Rico. I love to be on time. I like the, how these things are very organized, that kind of thing. But. When I went to Kentucky, another word came to me, and I said, no, I cannot, you know. I, I think that more than American, I'm San Franciscan or Bay Area person. And I, I don't know you made those distinctions, so what is for you to be an American or feel like an um, Afghan American or that kind of thing? Um, well, you bring up an interesting point, and, and I will say <laughs> this. Uh, I think... I, I don't want to make that distinction that you're making, even though I am a San Franciscan and I'm this type of guy, and um, I'm not uh, particularly close to those people who um, 
cling to religion and guns because they're bitter about losing their jobs. <laughs> uh, you know, my sister lives in Kentucky, in eastern, um, eastern Kentucky, and it's a very, uh, you know, to go there is depressing for me. But it's depressing because the, that part of the world is just so economically downtrodden. It's amazing to me that, uh, that a part of America is just so stepped on and so without an economy at all. And I feel like, you know, I, when I say I feel like an American, what I feel like is when we have a new president, we should be thinking about helping some of those places rather than that's not my place, so I want, you know, you know, I want to, I, I think we're all Americans and I want to uh, figure out how we can improve things in Kentucky so that we can, so that they, they can be more like San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. I guess we'll, um, and we'll end it on that note. Yes, we will. Okay. All right. Thank well, you thank you all. Me.